Yes. 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 Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. And uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Gerhard Grill, the director of the office who's going to chair our next session. Thank you very much, Emily. <clears throat> I have the honor of introducing the next presentation by Professor Neuhold. Uh, professor Neuhold is a professor of political science in Maastricht University. <clears throat> I presume that I was asked to be the chair because uh, we speak the same language, or shall I say, paraphrasing a famous saying, <clears throat> we are divided by a common language, <laughs> me being Bavarian and she being Austrian. Uh, <clears throat> the topic is the relationship between the European Ombudsman and the European Parliament. The treaty directs the Ombudsman to examine the administrative behavior of all the EU institutions, agencies, offices, and bodies, with the exception of the Court of Justice acting in its judicial role. That, of course, squarely includes the European Parliament. At the same time, Parliament holds a very special role as regards the Ombudsman. We've already heard Parliament appoints the Ombudsman. Parliament may take the initiative of triggering the procedure for removing the Ombudsman from office. Um, Parliament lays down the regulations governing the um, work of the European Ombudsman. And finally, last but not least, Parliament is, together with Council, the budgetary authority deciding on <coughs> what resources the Ombudsman uh, can work with. Um, so quite an interesting position. And the question is, therefore, how is the Ombudsman controlling the institution that appoints you? I'm curious to find out more about this. The floor is yours, Professor Neuhold. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here today with uh, former and present ombudsmen and also members of the European Parliament. It's always a challenge for an academic to present in front of the people that know the institutions best, and that is you, but I will still try my best. So, and first of all, I will also try to master this. Yes. Here, I'm not going to rehearse the debate of the democratic deficit and what can be done to alleviate the democratic deficit. As you well know, it's a very far-reaching debate, far-reaching academic debate. But one of the strands that has been identified is, in this debate is that the EU drives on different vectors of legitimacy. And one of these vectors is procedural legitimacy transparency, consultation of stakeholders, etc., or something that is more pervasive to me called government with the people, involving the people in the decision-making process of the European Union. And this is where the European Ombudsman very neatly fits in. So the European Ombudsman, as Paul Magnet already coined, more than 10 years ago, illustrates a trend in the European Union which consists in subjecting the EU's institutions <laughs> to a standard set of rules and procedures. But I like the government with the people and this image of the Acropolis. So we just had an uh, accountability landscape. Now we have an image of the Acropolis government with the people. As we've heard many times today, it is of course the Maastricht Treaty that set up the role of the European Ombudsman. And if you trace the negotiations, and that is also very nicely done in the first report of the first European Ombudsman, who's here with us today. If you trace the negotiations, you will see that there were different positions. Different positions of member states, so Denmark and Spain, for instance, on one side, and apparently on the other side, the European Parliament, which saw itself as the uh, institution embodying the people, if you so will, saw so itself as the guardian of the citizens' rights. And there was, the Ombudsman was seen as a possible, I stress, possible form of competition. The Maastricht Treaty is then a consensus and brings together these possible uh, tensions. So we've heard a lot about this. On the one hand, the role of the Ombudsman is clearly defined and acts under the direct supervision of the European Parliament. And this is what I want to look at today. Political scientists always come up with fancy terms. So here is also the term of the hybrid nature of the European Ombudsman, the body to set up the, to control the institutions where the European Parliament is one of them. And we've discussed this today. Its role also comes close to that of a court. 
the ombudsman, and this is not defined in the <coughs> treaty, I thought we would hear a lot about the concept of maladministration, but we're probably going to still get there. This concept is not defined in the treaties, but also maladministrations, including the European Parliament. So here is where I want to situate my research, we've heard about this as well. The European Parliament, after hearing of the, uh, of the Ombudsman to be in front of the Petitions Committee, elects uh, the Ombudsman. And here are two very important things characterizing the relationship between the European Parliament and uh, the European Ombudsman. On the one hand, the European Ombudsman can present a special report to Parliament. But this special report has been used very sparingly. But it is seen as the ombudsman's ultimate weapon. I quote one of the ombudsmen. And here, the mere existence, and we find that in the European Union in general, the mere existence of certain procedures can already motivate an institution to adapt its behavior. Special reports are thus more the exception than the rule. And what is also very important, what I didn't know when I embarked on this endeavor of doing this research, which is key between the European Parliament and the Ombudsman, is that the Ombudsman will not investigate the political work of the European Parliament and the concept of maladministration is seen not to include the bodies of the European Parliament, i.e. also its committees. And this boundary was set by the European Ombudsman uh, for by the European Ombudsman himself and is apparent from the first annual report and I also quote that uh, in the paper. So this is an important uh, distinction in the way the Ombudsman operates. And then I had a very big research question. I've modified this research question. How does the Ombudsman, does the Ombudsman act as an independent institution vis-a-vis -vis the European Parliament? What I then found is, looking at the cases against the European Parliament uh, in front of the European Ombudsman, I then modified my question somewhat, because I found there's a clear, uh, all the cases are done with very great care, there's a clear independence, notion of independence here. But then I put on my political science hat and thought, are there any roles that the Ombudsman plays? Are there patterns that we can discern in the way the Ombudsman deci uh, decides over time? So for the time being, and I have no story for this, except that I had limited time, for the time being I've looked at the last decade, so from 2005 to 2015. And before I shed light finally on the results, I want to say a few words, because I think we also have members of the parliament here, but, uh, on the relationship between the European Ombudsman and the Petitions uh, Committee. This is described as a very consensual relationship, but what we also have to note, that the Petitions Committee can issue own initiative reports following up an inquiry by the European Ombudsman. But the Petitions Committee only has a number, a limited number of reports that it can issue per legislative period. So it uses this uh, tool very sparingly, but then very effectively. So one of the cases, and I come, it has already been said, it's irrelevant for this talk, but I come from Vienna, and in Vienna, I've also heard about this case, of course, um, we have a new airport. I hope you never had to use it. But um, this, uh, this, there was a, a big case because this airport had not been subject to environmental uh, impact assessment. And then the Ombudsman actually issued a special report followed up by an own initiative report and then a resolution by the European Parliament. So here you can also see the interplay between both institutions leading to more debate, leading to more mediatization of certain issues and also setting standards for future cases in this field. This we have seen a little bit to some extent just to set the scene. Is the European Parliament actually the target of many cases? No, it is of course the Commission and then the number of cases, so here I only took the annual report from 2013, is very limited um, per year, number of cases against the European uh, Parliament. 
So this is just to set the scene. I've then looked at the number of cases, as I've said, from January 1st until May 2015, but they're not all the cases on the website of the European Parliament, uh, of the European Ombudsman. Some of these cases are actually resolved by the so-called telephone procedure, so where uh, an issue is actually settled either by telephone or uh, by email, an issue that is easily solved. If, oh, Okay, this is actually the crucial slide, but it doesn't seem to show. I cannot tell you why, but I can tell you what it says on the slide. It's very simple. It says that uh, decisions of the European Ombudsman following an inquiry against the European Parliament, in, 60, in 76 cases, the European, there was no maladministration and the case was settled. And in 36 cases, maladministration was found. So. What we see from the slide or what we don't see, a majority of the cases, the, the Ombudsman found no maladministration. Now I've been jumping a lot. Okay, if you then look at the issues that actually gave rise to the uh, complaints to the European Ombudsman against uh, the European Parliament, on the one hand, we have alleged violations of staff regulations and alleged unfair treatment in competition and selection procedures. So here I found it also very interesting uh, the, the conciliatory role of the Ombudsman between the Parliament and uh, the complainant. And here one also saw the setting of best practices of standards for future recruitment procedures. For instance, that more information should be given when a certain decision is taken why someone is not uh, recruited. And when it comes to the alleged vi violation of uh, staff regulations, here it was very often, from what I would, could see about the allocation of merit points related to the promotion um, of staff. If we then look at the cases uh, where the Ombudsman identified maladministration, then it was very much about staff regulations and issues relating to transparency. And here we've already heard about the transparency of trilogues, the case that um, is just starting. Some of the cases in the past also transgress into the political sphere. So there were two uh, cases, closely related cases, to give public access to uh, the allowances of MPs in 2005, where the European Parliament refused to give access. The data protection supervisor was then consulted and the European Parliament maintained its refusal um, with the argument of data protection, but then actually also published more information uh, on this. Another case is on the names of members of parliament participating in a supplementary pension scheme. And here the ombudsman also made a finding of maladministration, a preliminary finding. And then the parliament actually voted down as a whole a concrete proposal from its budgetary committee to publish the list of names. The ombudsman then came to the conclusion that the parliament had made this an issue of political responsibility and uh, the case was then uh, closed. Here the, the Parliament was seen as accountable to the citizens and no longer to the Ombudsman. I think this is a very interesting point for discussion, uh, the dividing line between administrative issues and uh, political issues. So what, to conclude, we see a very close relationship between the Ombudsman and the European Parliament. The European Ombudsman did find quite a few cases of maladministration in the European Parliament, especially when it comes to violations of staff regulations and also issues of uh, transparency. And then, I think this is also very interesting for a political scientist, the spin-off of decisions. Debates about certain issues can shift into the public domain by media coverage, by Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've also seen that the Ombudsman now is very, very active in using social media. And this can lead to more <laughs> political debate also within the European Parliament itself, within its committees, within uh, plenary, and of course leads also to concrete action points. 
So now I come to, when I looked at the cases, I suddenly saw um, there's a pattern. You can actually um, character categorize the way the European Ombudsman acts, not only vis-a-vis -vis the European Parliament, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Parliament. So on the one hand, it's an arbitrary, the, the role of an arbitrator between those that have a complaint and the European Parliament. And I've seen in a majority of cases, this actually led to a settlement. Setting best practices when it comes to good administration within the European Parliament, or as Ian Harden, who was so kind to talk to me before, said systemic improvements. This sounds much better than best practices. Systemic improvements, um, setting the path for future cases. Transparency watchdog. Yesterday, when I was thinking about this speech, I thought, it is actually maybe not very polite to talk about transparency watchdog. Maybe you should have talked about guardian of transparency. But then I looked at the Ombudsman's website and there the term is used. So I must have come across it uh, before. So this is also a very, very interesting case. Is of course this trilogue case, which um, I've also worked on the, the trilogues in first reading, have re given rise also to a big academic debate um, what about access and, and access to documents, etc. So this is also a case that we will all watch with great interest. And then it also leads to more political debate, for instance, the Vienna airport case. So there's a lot of spin-off uh, of the decisions of the European Ombudsman. So if I then come to a close, we see that the European Ombudsman is not only an independent institution, but if we look at the whole uh, accountability landscape, as we've heard today, or if we look at the different vectors of legitimacy that have been identified, then the European Ombudsman is an institution that can be generally associated with attempts of legitimizing the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Norheld, for this very stimulating presentation. I'm particularly delighted that you chose this piece of art as the starting point. Uh, the artist you know that know, Leo von Klenze, is one of the most famous artists who transformed Munich in the early 19th century. And the depiction of the Acropolis, of course, um, has, a, has a, an, an actual touch as well, uh, reminding us of other matters that are ongoing. Um, <clears throat> with this, I would like to open the discussion. Um, we are privileged of in having members of the European Parliament here. So perhaps if I may be so bold as to ask Mrs. Hautala perhaps to uh, start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, first of all, I I'm very, feel very privileged to be around this table to discuss with yourselves. And uh, yes, indeed, I think um, there's perhaps one aspect from the point of view of a member of Parliament uh, uh, is that uh, there's always been a, a rich interaction between the European Ombudsman's Office and, and those MEPs who wanted from inside to correct things, to, 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 to make our institution more, more legitimate. And I, I, I remember those early discussions on the allowances that some um, very proud um, German Christian Democratic mem lawyers, uh, members of the Legal Affairs Committee, uh, were insisting till the very end that, uh, for instance, to, to publish the names of the, assist, the parliamentary assistants would breach um, uh, a legal principle because they claimed that these are private contracts between the MEP and, and the assistant. Uh, of course, that all changed later because it was kind of revealing the thing that um, such um, contracts perhaps should not, at, after all, be between individual MEPs and the assistant because that would also imply, let's say, uh, not sufficient accountability on, on the conditions of work and or pay and all that. So that all changed later so that now they are indeed controlled by the institutions and independent, uh, how are they called, paying agents actually. But uh, I think the very simple argument at that time from those of us who felt very uncomfortable about the prevailing situation was that we are using taxpayers' money so we need to be accountable. And of course, if there are some specific reasons to, to not to disclose names of an assistant, that then uh, we should uh, look at the, the, the directive on, on data protection 
And, uh, you know, if, for, for instance, there would be a, a risk to personal safety of an assistant by publishing his or her name, then that should not happen. So always there was a rich interaction. And um, the, um, another example I'd like to mention from more recent times, now that I've been appointed a standing rapporteur of the Legal Affairs Committee on the hopefully future uh, law and administrative procedure, and uh, which is, of course, the, let's say, originates from from uh, Jakob Söderman and, and many others who have contributed. Now, I discovered during a hearing where I think Professor Hoffman was also, and some of you were present in the committee last autumn, that indeed there was a, a report by a former MEP and vice president of the parliament, Dagmar Rothberg, on how to improve the parliament's own administration. And then I discovered that this report would not be available easily. And then I wrote a very formal short letter, which I, that, that's a kind of a format that I, I, I know very well. I referred to, to my, first of all, my function in the parliament uh, dealing with the matter. And secondly, um, I, I mentioned that it, it, there should definitely be no obstacle for, for publishing this report because it, it also could be interesting for the citizens. I got a very friendly letter saying that, yes, indeed, here is the report, and we have just published it on the website. So sometimes uh, it is not just the, uh, let's say, rigid understanding that certain things must be kept within the institution and not disclosed, but it's a kind of, a, you know, not really paying attention. And there you need a lot of uh, people and institutions, including the European Ombudsman, who remind the institution that actually they've forgotten something that they are committed to. Thank you very much. Mrs. Wickstrom. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to share with you my experiences on the cooperation between the, the, institute, the European Ombudsman and, and the Parliament, the Parliament's Petitions Committee, of which I'm the chairman since 2014 only, so my, my experience is quite limited. But let me assure you that the, the existing relationship between the European Ombudsman and the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament is excellent. So that's all in all. I could stop there, but I will not. I will not. <laughs> because there is so much to do. As you know, the Petitions Committee is the only institution within, in Europe that actually deals with citizens' own personal experiences of difficulties with the institutions or, or with the national governments or authorities. And it's actually us that could, if we are very well functioning, could bridge the gap between the European institutions and the electorate, the citizens. And we are trying to do that, and we are trying to do it as, as um, well as we possibly can. And we need to do it. We do it by, by the citizens' initiative. We are doing, dealing with more than 4,000 petitions every year. And we also have a special responsibility for the existing relation with the European Ombudsman, which is excellent, as I told you. Um, now, when it comes to the items that you defined, and thank you for your presentation, I, I really enjoyed it very much. I think it was a very, very, not only timely, but also extremely useful. We will now, this afternoon, have a decision in my committee on uh, appointing a rapporteur for the activities of the European Ombudsman, for, for, and we'll do it today. So I'll bring with me to the coordinators the importance of the subject matter. When it comes to the role of the European Ombudsman as arbitrator, I would like to see it as sometimes even as a role of a mediator. That would be extremely useful because it's, use, it's, it's needed within the institutions today. Um, the Ombudsman as being the transparency watchdog. Well, I cannot more than subscribe to everything that has been said by Heidi on this, but I would like to add the importance of an increased transparency when it comes to the legislative procedure. In other words, the, the, um, the trialogues, because that is absolutely impossible. There is no transparency whatsoever, and this is finalizing le legislation for, Euro for Europe. In the last mandate, I was the rapporteur for 10 different reports, which is a lot. One of them being the Dublin regulation. 
that people started working on in 1999 with the Common European Asylum System in the Tampere program it was. It was concluded in 2013 and we were a team. I, well, as you know, the Dublin regulation is the cornerstone of this uh, Common European Asylum System and today extremely questioned, by the way. Um, and very well so. I, 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 I very much would like to see it replaced by a, a different instrument. It is, in a, in a way, uh, very much of a 1990 instrument that doesn't fit very well into society today. But having said that, I was suffering, and I tell you, suffering, when I realized that me working in five years on ten reports, a lot of trialogues, I conducted dozens of trialogues, and no transparency whatsoever. If I could now, Emily, in public tell you that this is something that I would very much encourage you and your office to look into, because it's an increasing problem. It's, a, it's a, an issue that is um, raising more and more awareness in this mandate, Take, bearing in mind that more than 50% of, of the members are newly elected members. Uh, they didn't, there are so many that, that, that have no experience whatsoever in working uh, on, the, on the Nice Treaty. Everyone is now working and have its, his or her only political experience under the Lisbon Treaty with co-decision. So co-decision is one thing, and trialogues conducted behind closed doors in camera is something that we should really try to shred light upon. What else did I want to tell you on this? If the um, well, the staff regulation and, and, uh, and what you pointed out as maladministration concerning the European Parliament. The staff regulation, uh, the competition and selection goes hand in hand with that. I worked on the staff reg regulation together with Dagmar Rothberent in the previous le uh, legislature when I was the, the, the coordinator in the Legal Affairs Committee. Well, it leaves a lot to wish for still today. Uh, it was decided uh, after a lot of different um, maneuvers, but the staff regulation is there now. It's up and running, but there is a lot to look into. So I think that, Emily, with that, I'll leave it to you and to your office. <laughs> and I look forward to our, our good and increasingly good cooperation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Emily? Um, thank you, Gerhard, and, and thank you, Madam Wickstrom, for, for expressing what I, I, I agree with you as, a, as an excellent working relationship with, uh, with the Petitions Committee, and I, I look forward even to appearing before you uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon. This, this is, it's a, it is a very, if, if one is being honest, one has to acknowledge that it is a, a tricky area for an ombudsman, and I think Jakob has, has uh, explained it uh, uh, very well. Um, if, if you, when you get a complaint in relation to Parliament, I think we, we do take uh, <coughs> a lot of care in, in seeing what's something that might appear to us as a simple administrative matter. The question we ask ourselves, how and will this be politicised? And if we are conscious that it's going to be politicised, even if we think that it really is an issue of, of administration or or, or highlights a principle which Parliament is theoretically bound by through the treaties or the Charter as well, but then you have to make a political decision yourself in relation to, uh, uh, to, to what you're going to do uh, about it. And, and Jakob described uh, how, how he uh, bounced the issue of, of expenses and so on, allowances to the Court of Auditors. Uh, uh, Nicky Forrest decided to take a different route and was not, uh, not thanked for his, for his uh, trouble. And then you have a situation where, uh, you know, you have an ombudsman who, is, who has lost support, um, which damages potentially the institution. So, you know, wh what is the brave thing to do? Uh, is it really the brave thing for the institution to try and, and run a mile from complaints that can be politicised in relation to Parliament, or is it, is it the brave thing to do to, to press on? And, and those are, are very difficult issues that, 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 that ombudsmen um, face. 
Um, I, I have a, a report, and I absolutely agree that the reports to Parliament should be, uh, should be uh, at a minimum, not because of fear that they're going to be politicised, but because really uh, an effective ombudsman office should be getting most of their recommendations across the line, and it should only be in very rare and very important cases that you actually have to go to, to, uh, uh, to Parliament and seek the report and seek their support. Um, a report that, that uh, I will shortly, I think, uh, be uh, uh, discussed in Parliament concerns what really is an administrative matter, if you like, and that is a, a recommendation that was made actually by my predecessor, but I'm following it, it on by making a report to Parliament, uh, again concerning Frontex, and the recommendation is that Frontex should have um, a complaints mechanism. Uh, just as most uh, agencies and institutions do. It seems a, a routine thing uh, that, that they should have. This has been resisted by, by Frontex on the grounds that if there are breaches of human rights, it's the, um, it's the, uh, it's the member states who, who have to account for that. I, 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 I don't agree with that for several reasons. Um, but the, the problem is that uh, inevitably when you're talking about issues to do with Frontex and, and migrants and so on, it does leach into the debate on migration, which, as you know, is, is very sensitive and, and very divisive um, within Parliament. So on the one hand, you're trying to be like as dry and as boring as possible about what the, about what the issue is. It's only about whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, you risk uh, it, it becoming a, a political football. And if it then becomes that, then what, what are the consequences uh, down the line? Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think, I think you know, as, as has been explained by a number of speakers uh, here, it, it, it can be a difficult area because uh, ultimately you, you have to rely on, on Parliament. Uh, it, it is your ultimate weapon. If the institutions are, are refusing to accept what you're doing and if you think that it is a very important issue, then, then you really have a duty to go to Parliament and seek their support and hope that they are going to show a, a united front, if, if at all possible. Um, okay, thank you. Before giving the floor, Mrs. Wickstrom again, I think Ian wants to tell us how he lived through Easter 1996. <laughs> Thank you, Gerhard. I, I just wanted to make two very brief points. Um, first, the discussion reminded me of a, an excellent paper by the former Danish ombudsman, Hans Gamaltoft Hansen, on the role of the ombudsman vis-a-vis -vis politics. And this, uh, he, he wrote this paper after a conflict which involved the Danish prime minister and it, it is an excellent paper. I'm not sure where it's published, but uh, if you remind me uh, afterwards, Professor Neuheld, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you because I think you might find it um, interesting and, and, and useful. He, he develops a conceptual apparatus in there, which I think is uh, of, of general interest. The second point concerns the uh, absence of conflict between the Petitions Committee and the European Ombudsman. Partly, I think this is it turned out that, of course, the European Ombudsman doesn't have a mandate to deal with complaints against member states' authorities, and the bread and butter work of the Committee on Petitions is precisely petitions against the member state authorities. So there was the potential for a harmonious relationship there, which, uh, which, which did indeed develop. But trying to link this now to the discussion that we had in the previous session, the Committee on Petitions is itself a member of the European Network of Ombudsmen. And the, if, if one's exploring the potential or thinking in, in general terms about the potential for trying to coordinate and rationalize mechanisms of accountability, the relationship between the Committee on Petitions through the European Network of Ombudsmen with the National Ombudsman is potentially an interesting subject because it's the national ombudsman of the Committee on Petitions of the European Parliament, which in some cases at least are dealing or potentially dealing with, with the same subject. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> I hope we're not leaving anybody out. Mrs. Wickstrom, please. Thank you. I wanted to highlight the importance uh, that, that was uh, that, that um, Mr. Söderman started out with, that the Petitions Committee has not been considered the most important committee of the House, which is absolutely true. 
in the previous mandate when I was coordinator in the Legal Affairs Committee and later on in the Liber Committee, everything that came from the Petitions Committee was thrown into the wastebasket immediately. So, is it useful for the Petitions Committee to only work with the Ombudsman on issues such as Frontex? Absolutely not. And you know, the organization that, that the Ombudsman report comes to the Petitions Committee is not always that efficient because it's actually legal legislative competence. Now, it's very lucky that I'm at the same time coordinator in LIBE, which means that we have an excellent cooperation between LIBE and Petitions Committee this mandate. But systematically, there is, there is, there is a flaw. We, we should really make sure that petitions, ombudsman reports, uh, petitions from citizens are taken seriously by the legislative committees. And this is what I now try to do. But it's not easy. It's really, really difficult to actually take the next step and make the petitions or the reports point of departure for a legislative procedure with the legislative competent committees. But believe me, this is hard work. So according to Rule 54 or 55, this can be dealt with. But given the fact that the Petitions Committee has not been a priority of the House, it's a very hard work. And I need your help in actually trying to come to a point where <laughs> petitions can be point of departure for a legis legislative procedure. But then it takes two to tango, as we know. We need them to be welcomed by the other committees, not only by LIBE in this case, but the other, there are many, many environmental issues, and believe me, I have never, I cannot foresee today that the same would apply to, to ENVY. But everything boils down to the personal relationship and how you can reach out to each other, and this is really something that should be addressed. It cannot, it cannot be left to, to personal, individ, per, to individuals to actually deal with with it this way. It should be systematic. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, yeah, absolutely. And we, we have, in, in putting the report uh, to Parliament, I suppose the issue in relation to Frontex is not so much that there would be a debate about, about migration, but that an issue of administration becomes something else, that you're dealing with an issue which is uh, the obligation or what should be an obligation on, on an EU agency to have a complaints mechanism and then that turns into an argument about allowing criminals into um, EU territory, which has happened when I, when I presented it to, to, to that. So, uh, I, of course, we will and, and do the, the right thing, but it can be rather frustrating when the right thing is, is twisted into, into something else and uh, an outcome happens that is, is, is not... Uh, uh, really is not the right thing. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, Professor Nauda, again for this presentation and for all of us to the, for the discussion. Um, <clears throat> the, the only regret I have is that there is no video coverage of the first presentation of the newly elected European Ombudsman to the Committee on Petitions, uh, but uh, I, I take Jakob's advice to do the right thing, and that is clearly to hand over now as rapidly as possible to Harry Kaufmann. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now, of course, just uh, to add to this debate, and obviously the two sessions are interlinked, talking about the relation between the Ombudsman and the European Parliament, and then talking now about political independence. Of course, the difficulty is always to distinguish a technical matter from a political matter, because as we know, anything that can go wrong will become political, and maladministration festering in a system will become a political issue in itself. So the, uh, believing that we can really distinguish clearly one from the other is, is, uh, raises some certain questions. But now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Georges Tridimas from the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland and Takis Tridimas from King's College in London. Um, and uh, they will talk about the issue of political independence and public awareness. <laughs> 